Lords of the Land, דבר תורה ופרשת בהר. A year ago I declared that I love פרשת בהר, and although I'm not going back on that declaration, I think I discovered an essential point that confused me in the past. The parasha doesn't behave as expected. Sefer Vaikra, the book the sages called Torat Kohanim, as the name suggests, addresses the Kohanim. Although some topics in the book are also relevant to other parts of the Israeli society, the Kohanim take center stage. This is significant to understanding the book, and is also expressed in the, there being no parasha in the book that doesn't feature one of two words, Kohen, all except Parashat Shmini, or Aharon, all except Doshim and Bechukotai. That is, no parasha except Parashat Behar. The absence of the word Kohen from the parasha is only a symptom. The connection between the Kohanim and the topics discussed in the parasha is also unclear. Most of the parasha moves on the axis between the land and the treatment of the weak, with many referring to both. Examples of this are Shemitah, Yovel, the sale and redemption of land, etc. My difficulty here stems from two directions. The first, according to Sefer Dvarim, the Kohen has no share and property of the land. So what does he have to do with the parasha dealing mostly with landowners? The second, the Kohen does receive gifts from the land, like the poor mentioned in the parasha, but these gifts are not mentioned here, rather in Sefer Dvarim in the aforementioned source. At first, I thought it might be worth redefining the boundaries of the parasha, declaring Parashat Behar Bechukotai as a single parasha, not as a matter of need, but as a matter of content. There is some evidence for this. First, the division of the parashiot read today, according to the tradition first practice in Babylon, chose to attach parashiot of a similar nation, such as Vayakhel, Kudei, Tazria, Metzora. both of them dealing with the same content. Combining Behar Bechukotai raises the question of whether there were originally two parashiot that were joined when necessarily, or perhaps they started as one parasha that sometimes had to be split. Second, the structure of the parashiot supports the expansion of their borders. Parashat Behar opens with the unusual pasuk and Hashem spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai saying, speak to the Israelites. And Parashat Bechukotai ends with a mirroring verse. These are the commandments that Hashem commanded Moshe to the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. The verses seemed to point to an essential connection between the two passages. I don't know how to confirm or disprove the first proof, so I won't try. The second proof is a bit more problematic because the two words highlighted on Mount Sinai appear in four times in Vayikra and not twice. The first is in the middle of Parashat Tzav, signing the parasha of the Korbanot. This is the Torah which Hashem commanded Moshe on Mount Sinai, on the day he commanded the Israelites. The second is the verse that opens Parashat Behar. The third seals this warning of Parashat Bechukotai. These are the laws, the judgments, and the Torah that Hashem gave between himself and the children of Israel on Har Sinai in the hand of Moshe. And the fourth seals Parashat Bechukotai and the entire Sefer of Vaikra. The decision to define the boundaries at the beginning of Behar and at the end of Bechukotai removes the first and third appearance from the equation, a decision that, in my opinion, is not entirely justified considering that the word commanded that appears in the first and fourth point to a much stronger connection between them. That's why I'm left with only the third proof, which is the content itself. Parashat Bechukotai concludes with the laws of the monetary value of various articles, among them land value laws, which correspond with the land laws in Parashat Behar. In the laws of Arachin, the Kohen stars. He is the one who decides... On human and land value the Hekdesh field belongs to him he has an important role it could be argued that the Chukotai couldn't be understood without Behar preceding it but this can be taken a step further the relationship our Kohanim have with the land can be compared to the relationship the Egyptian Kohanim and Bereshit have with the land during the seven-year famine the Egyptian people sell all their land to Yosef for food the only ones exempt are the priests the Kohanim because it is a law for the Kohanim from Paro that they do not sell their land at a time of great crisis the only ones who don't need to worry are the Kohanim the law protects them 
Our Kohanim, on the other hand, is taught in Parashat Behar that discusses land ownership laws. The Kohen is not mentioned, not even when mentioning the Levite cities, cities with no agricultural economic fields. The Kohen joins only in Bechukotai, the parasha that discusses dedicating the land to God, where the role of the Kohen is clear since he is Hashem's representative. His notable non-existent in the portion discussing land ownership conveys a stronger message. The role of the Kohen is not to take care of himself. He has no land even in prosperous times, let alone times of austerity. In contrast to priests of Egypt, whose religious role begins with taking care of themselves, the priests of Hashem, who receive all their money from what the people set aside, depend on the fate and success of the people and are not present at all in the general economic sphere. If you enjoyed this video, please share, subscribe, press like, anything helps. I am Dovi Holtz, one that loves Tanakh.